All right, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's me, Dr. Kaz, and I'm coming to you uh, today to discuss our last topic uh, in our course, and that is going to be human development. So without any further ado, let's jump right into it. We're going to be discussing um, a couple different topics, uh, development, pregnancy, and hereditary. And so if we are going to be discussing development, we are going to be discussing embryology, right? And that is going to be the study of development prior to birth. Right? So we're actually going to see, all right, how right, once the oocytes uh, has been fertilized by their spermatogonia, all right, now we're going to discuss uh, the development of that union and what happens okay and then we'll also discuss uh what happens during pregnancy uh the changes that occur in mom both anatomically and physiologically and then we're also going to finish up and discuss about genetic traits who gives what to whom right what mom gave uh to the newborn and what dad gave to the newborn all right so let's talk about the prenatal period all right, what happens after fertilization of the secondary oocyte from the sperm? All right, the prenatal period is going to be a period of 38 weeks. It can sometimes be as long as 40, all right? And there's three periods to it, all right? What we call the pre-embryonic period, followed by the embryonic period, and then finally the fetal period. And we use this little wheel here to kind of explain all those, all right? So we're going to discuss here's fertilization. We start with fertilization. All right, then we have our pre-embryonic period, followed by our embryonic period, all of this, and then finally the fetal period here. What happens? All right, so let's start off, okay, with the prenatal period in the first part, which is known as the pre-embryonic period. This is going to be, all right, the first two weeks after the oocyte has been fertilized here. Once that occurs, once fertilization happens, all right, um, that union, we now refer, all right, to the organism as a zygote, all right? And so our zygote here is going to be a multicellular structure, okay, that's going to eventually develop, it's gonna go through a couple of, of, of changes here, all right? pretty much just cellular, a lot of cellular division. And we're gonna wind up with a structure called a blastocyst. And it's this blastocyst that is going to wind up entering into the uterine cavity and then implanting itself all right, into our functional layer of the endometrium, all right, that uterine lining. Remember, we spent all that time all right, at, uh, trying to prepare the endometrial layer, that basal layer there, all right, or excuse me, not the basal layer, but the functional layer, all right, in, in receiving, all right, that fertilized egg, all right. Once we get there, now we're going to implant there, and then for the next possibly nine months, all right, or not nine months, but the, the next 38 weeks there, 36 to 38 weeks, we are going to have a developing fetus growing in there, and then eventually, hopefully, have a newborn at the end of this whole process here. All right, the second period in our prenatal period is the embryonic period. Okay, so after the first two weeks, all right, we have our, our embryonic period, which can last from the third through eight week here. Okay, and the big uh, 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 process or uh, um, outcome is we start to see the development and the appearance of some of our major organ systems will occur. And we're going to kind of break this down and go through this, all right. Uh, so you'll have a better uh, understanding. But now, all right, our organism is now known as the embryo, okay? So that's going to be the third through the eighth week. And then finally, the fetal period, all right, the remaining 30 weeks, all right, then we are going to refer to our organism as a fetus, okay? And in this situation, the fetus, and we'll talk about this, all right, we're going to continue the fetus uh, and its growth, all right, but also we're going to get the development of a lot of those systems and tissues and whatnot, which will uh, contribute to the complexity 
of that organism there. Okay, so the last two uh, phase periods here, the embryonic and the fetal period, or excuse me, not the last two, the first two, all right, uh, phases, all right, our pre-embryonic period and our embryonic period, we refer to that as embryogenesis, all right? So we'll see quite a bit occurring, and that's what we're going to talk about now, uh, what is going to happen during embryogenesis. So let's start off, all right, by talking about fertilization, okay? We really didn't get into that in, uh, in any detail when we were discussing um, what was happening with uh, the reproductive portion. We just kept saying fertilization, fertilization. Well, what is fertilization? What happens with fertilization, okay? So we know, all right? The sperm and the egg unites, all right? So we refer to those cells as gametes. So the two gametes, all right, from the male and female uh, partner here, they, they uh, unite, they fuse together, and we had two haploid cells, all right? Now they unite to form our diploid cell, okay? So we see genetic material coming from the uh, maternal chromosomes from mom and then the paternal chromosomes from dad, all right? Um, the gamete, uh, not the gamete, but the zygote now has genetic material from both parents. So the big story is we now have restored our diploid number of chromosomes. So we went from 23 to 46. All right. During this process for fertilization, we now know whether we have a male or female organism. And that's dependent upon the sex chromosomes. All right. If we have two X chromosomes, then it's a female. All right, if we have an X and a Y, then it's a male, okay? So now, when fertilization occurs, now we are going to see, all right, just this rapid mitotic division of cells, and we call that cleavage, okay? Normally, fertilization, we've said this many times before, occurs in the ampulla, okay? That is the medial portion of the fallopian tube to the infundibulum. All right, the infundibulum is that funnel-shaped structure, and then we get to the ampulla, all right, and that's going to be the widest portion of the uterine tube, all right, and then from the uh, ampulla, we move towards the isthmus there, okay? So like I said before, all right, the secondary oocyte is only viable for 24 hours, all right? So once ovulation occurs, we have 24 hours to fertilize that oocyte, whereas sperm are viable for three to four days. They're Gives them, no pun intended, a little bit more wiggle room, all right, for viability, all right, where the secondary oocyte is only viable for that short period of time, that 24 hours there, okay? So when we talk about fertilization, all right, we're going to really kind of talk about both the roles of the oocyte and the sperm. So we're going to start off here talking about the sperm here. And so the sperm have to undergo, all right, this process of capacitation, okay? And what will happen is, all right, as the male sperm are traveling through the female reproductive tract here, all right, we're going to see, all right, these physiological changes that are going to occur to the sperm, all right, and it's basically going to be the removal, all right, of certain structures from that plasma membrane of the sperm. Now, this goes up for a little while, okay? Um, but again, it's part of the preparation process of sperm, all right, for fertilization, okay? For that fertilization. So that first part, all right, that capacitation is we're going to be just stripping things off of the sperm, all right, getting it ready, all right, to for fertilization here, okay? So fertilization begin or fertilization begins, but the process begins, all right, during intercourse, all right, the male ejaculates, all right, and that 200 to 500 million sperm, all right, are going to enter into the vagina, okay? Now, again, that's a large number, I know, but a very small number of those sperm in the ejaculate even have a chance, okay, of fertilization, okay? A couple hundred that, if that, okay? So a lot of folks, you know, will might ask, well, Dr. Kaz, where, how do the sperm know where to go, okay? Great question, all right? We saw, all right, 
way back when, when we discussed, all right, the process of chemotaxis, all right, during an injury, where we had that skateboarder, that kid fell off his skateboard, brushed his knee, all right, injured, all right, the epidermis and the dermis, all right, and we saw what occurred, all right, how we got the migration of certain white blood cells and other cells to the area of injury, all right, similar type of situation will occur here is that the oocytes, all right, during ovulation is going to be releasing chemicals. And those chemicals act as a homing beacon for the sperm, and they attract the sperm towards the oocyte. Okay? It's going, so that is going to then attract the sperm towards the oocyte, all right? And we'll see, all right, the sperm start to move towards that secondary oocyte, all right, by the release of those chemicals, all right? And all it takes is one, one sperm, all right, to make it to that secondary oocyte. And then it has to try to uh, burrow its way, all right, through the protective uh, uh, layering of the secondary oocyte to get into the oocyte and have its nucleus and bind with the, the uh, secondary oocyte's nucleus. Because remember, we're still dealing with haploid cells here. The secondary oocyte is haploid and the sperm is haploid, right? We need to unite those, uh, um, those nuclei where the, those chromosomes are residing to get our diploid cell, right? So that's what we need to have happen. So our sperm now have made it up there, all right, into the ampulla, all right? They found the secondary oocyte. And now, all right, we need the sperm to actually make its way through the outermost layer of that secondary oocyte, which is the corona radiata, okay? So this is our first phase here, all right? So it is actually got to push its way through the corona radiata, all right? Remember, we talked about the corona radiata. Those were those granulosa cells, all right, that were on the outer portion of our secondary oocyte, okay? So the sperm have to make it through the corona radiata, and then they make it through the corona radiata, then they got to make it by the zona pellucida, okay? So we first have to make our way through the corona radiata, burn our way through there. Now, once we make it through the corona radiata, we're not done. We are not done, okay? So the, the, the flagellum is going to play a big role in, in pushing through the corona radiata. But remember, we have the zona pellucida with that glycoprotein layer right, that sits immediately outside of the secondary oocyte. No problem. Guess what? Now, all right, we make it through the corona radiata. Then the head of the sperm, all right, that a chromosome cap is going to now undergo what we call the chromosome reaction. And it's here, all right, we just talked about this, all right, during spermatogenesis, all right, about the digestive enzymes, all right, that sit in the chromosome cap there. And it's these digestive enzymes that allow the sperm to penetrate that glycoprotein layer, that zona pellucida. Bang. All right. If our one lucky candidate sperm makes it through that, all right, as soon as that occurs, all right, it's like a door gets slammed shut. The zona pellucida instantly hardens, and that is to prevent any other sperm from entering into the secondary oocyte. Because again, we only need 23 chromosomes. Right? We can't have any more, right? Because if we get two sperm by chance that enter in, call it polyspermy, now we've dumped in 23 triplets of chromosomes. One from each sperm, uh, one set I should say, all right? So we got 23 that come from one, sperm one, 23 chromosomes that come from two, sperm two, and don't forget the 23 chromosomes that are from the secondary oocyte, okay? So now we have triplets. That's bad. We cannot have that, all right? Usually when that occurs, all right, that can be fatal, all right? All right, so what happens when that one sperm makes its way, all right, through that zona pellucida and that zona pellucida slams shut and hardens, all right? Here's what happens. This, the, the, the plasma membranes of both gametes, of the sperm and the oocyte, fuse right away. And then the nucleus of the sperm enters into the oocyte, and that's 
the only thing from the sperm that enters into the oocyte. Okay, so when this occurs, now, okay, the secondary oocyte finishes that second meiotic division. Because remember, we were arrested in metaphase two this whole time with the secondary oocyte, stuck in metaphase two, okay, waiting to finish. Our sperm have already finished all their meiotic divisions, all right? So once this happens, now, all right, our secondary oocyte finally finishes its meiotic division. And at that point, it is no longer known as a secondary oocyte. We refer to it as an ovum. Okay, so now the nucleus of the sperm and the nucleus of the ovum fuse together. And we see a joining of both haploid number of chromosomes from both the sperm and the ovum. And now we have our diploid nucleus, pronuclei. And as soon as that occurs, as soon as that happens, all right, our organism gets a whole new name. It's referred to as a zygote. And a zygote is a single diploid cell. That's it. That's fertilization. A lot happens, but that's fertilization. So now we have our zygote. And we'll talk about what's going to happen there. Let me just show you this quick picture here. Okay. So here is that whole process in picture form. Okay. So our sperm cells are burning through the corona radiata, trying to get into the secondary oocyte, all right, keep in mind our secondary oocyte is carrying this first polar body, all right, from the completion of meiosis one, okay, meiosis one. Polar body is just, it's, it's a non-functional structure, okay? So when we go from our primary oocyte to our secondary oocytes, remember, we wind up with two cells. Here's cell number one, and then the rest of it is cell number two. All right, so our sperm bur burrows through the corona radiata, makes it through the corona radiata, the chromosome cap, all right, enters into the zona pellucida, and it goes through, all right, that a chromosome reaction there, all right, and when that occurs, that digestive enzymes from the chromosomes push it through, all right, through the zona pellucida, and then finally, now we'll get all right, a fusion of the plasma membrane of the sperm and a fusion of the plasma membrane of our oocytes. And then we'll see the nucleus of the sperm enter into the oocyte. When that occurs, all right, the secondary oocyte completes, all right, the meiosis two, all right, and, it, and both gametes have now completed, all right, meiosis two, okay? And then we will see a fusion here of the sperm pronucleus and the ovum pronucleus. And at that point, we'll have a diploid cell. And that diploid cell right, will now be termed a zygote. A zygote. So now we undergo the next portion here, going back to this. Okay. We just completed fertilization. Now we start to enter into all right, our embryogenesis. The first part all right, of our development is going to be the pre-embryonic period. It's known as cleavage. And what we're going to see is all right, we've got our zygote all right, cell, all right, which has 46 chromosomes now, it's diploid, is going to divide. It goes from two cells to four cells. All right, to eight cells, we call it a morula, all right? And then from the eight morula cell count to 16 more uh, 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 cell count, we call it a, that a blastocyst. And that's what cleavage is. We're just going to see, all right, the actual division, the mitotic division, all right, of the zygote. That's all it is, okay? It is a series of divisions through mitosis of the zygote. Okay, so we're going to see an increase in cell number, all right? And if you remember what that's called, that's called hyperplasia, all right? But not the overall size, which is hypertrophy. So we're just going to have hyperplasia, an increase in the cell number, all right? 
All right. So we start with one cell, the zygote, then it divides into two cells. All right. When we get up to eight cells, then we call it a morula. All right. <clears throat> or, or sorry, uh, when it gets up to 16 cells, we'll call, call it a morula. But understand, as these cells are dividing here, all right, they're not tightly packed yet. All right. By the time we hit the third division here, then the cells start to become tightly packed, all right? Hence, there is no hypertrophy, no increase in size yet, all right? Just in cell number, okay? Once we reach that 16 cell stage, we now call, all right, our structure, our organism a morula, all right? And we'll start to see, all right, the beginnings of a cavity occurring, kind of like what we saw in our follicles when we started to see that antrum start to appear all right here all right when we're dealing with our morula when we start to get a cavity beginning all right it fills up with fluid and we refer to that as the blastocyst cavity all right once we get to that portion then we refer to all right our organism as a blastocyst and at this stage here all right, we're still in the pre-embryo uh, development stage, all right, but now we have a blastocyst, all right, and now we're going to have a differentiation of some of the cells here in our structure, okay? The outermost cell, all right, uh, um, structure is going to be the trophoblast. That's the outer ring of cells that are on the outside of our cavity, all right? The trophoblast will eventually differentiate into the chorion, and that will eventually become the placenta, okay? And then we have the um, cells that kind of, you know, if you recall, when the follicles were differentiating in the ovaries, all right, when the follicles were, dif were differentiating into the ovaries, <clears throat> all right, the second, the, the, the oocyte got pushed to the periphery, well, we have a group of packed cells here in our blastocyst, and that they're going to be towards the periphery, all right? And we call that the embryo blast. This will eventually, all right, form the embryo here. But the important thing here is that these cells are pluripotent, which means they can turn into any type of tissue. And when I say any type of tissue, that means they can turn into epithelial tissue. They can turn into uh, connective tissue. They can turn into muscle tissue or nervous tissue. Pluripotent, all right? So let's take a look and see what we're looking at here. All right, a little bit of our stage development. You can see here ovulation has occurred. All right, our secondary oocyte now is in the ampulla. Sperm come, fertilize our secondary oocyte, all right? We have our two pronuclei, which will eventually fuse with one another and form our zygote, our 46 chromosome cell, our diploid cell. And then from that point, all right, our diploid cell will start to undergo rapid mitotic division. Okay, we go from two to four to eight cells to eventually 16 cells in our morula. Okay, and you can see, all right, as this is occurring, all right, our zygote is moving through all right, the fallopian tubes. By the time it enters into the uterine cavity, and this isn't true in every single case, but in most cases, all right, by the time it enters into the uterine cavity, all right, we now have our blastocyst. Okay, we have a cavity here, the blastocyst cavity surrounded by the trophoblast layer of cells, and then we have a grouping of cells pushed to one side, and that's the embryo blast. Okay, now, all right, our blastocyst will implant onto the endometrium onto the functional layer here. And when that occurs, all right, we're going, now we're going to talk about, all right, the implantation uh, phase and what happens here. We're going to see all the different changes that occur. Because now, once implantation occurs, now we can have hypertrophy. All right, the cells can get bigger. All right, as our cell number increases, now the cell size can increase. And we're going to actually see, all right, our fertilized embryos start to increase in size and mass and all that fun stuff, okay? All right, 
So by the end of the first week, the blastocyst should have implanted itself, all right, in the endometrium here. And think of it like a, a mole or whatever kind of or chipmunk, it burrows itself into the endometrium, all right? So by day seven, all right, the trophoblast, that outer layer, is going to differentiate or divide into two layers here, okay? All right, so the outermost layer is known as the syncytiotrophoblast, and that's going to be the part that's really going to kind of invade, all right, the endometrium into that functional layer. I mean, it's going to really move into that layer. Right? The inner layer is known as the cytotrophoblast. But again, both of these layers are going to eventually become, all right, part of the, uh, it'll eventually uh, differentiate, excuse me, into the placenta, okay? So at this point, our blastocyst has completely embedded itself into the uterine wall there, okay? Which is great because in the uterine wall, we have our uterine glands, all right? And we were, or we've, during that uh, period, all right, when we were talking about the, the uterine cycle there, all right, we have increased our uterine gland number in preparation for implantation, but we're also increasing the vascularity, all right, in that layer too, because as you know, all right, as something is growing and developing, it needs nutrients. So we need to provide those nutrients, all right, and to do so, all right, we're gonna increase the vascularity of that area. All right, so while this is going on, all right, our syncytiotrophoblast, I love saying that word, the syncytiotrophoblast is going to produce that HCG, the human chorionic gonadotropin, okay? And this is basically like a signal flare, all right, to the reproductive system saying, hey, eureka, success, implantation has successfully occurred, okay? So first thing we gotta do is we gotta maintain our corpus luteum because we need, all right, that estrogen and that progesterone all right, to maintain that uterine lining. So our corpus luteum is gonna be doing that, all right, for the first trimester, okay? So for close to three months, all right, the corpus luteum is gonna be producing that estrogen and progesterone, okay? So if this mother is trying to get pregnant and she wants confirmation of pregnancy, then she can take a pregnancy test all right, and then the pregnancy test, all right, the human chorionic gonadotropin is going to be uh, produced and released and secreted, I should say, in the urine. All right, so this is what some folks, when they're taking a home pregnancy test, are going to be looking for, all right, in their urine, in their pregnancy test. All right, so we'll see HCG around for about three months. All right, in a relatively high amount, I'll show you right here. All right, so the first three months, all right, of pregnancy, you'll see significantly elevated levels of HCG. Okay, by week two, all right, you can actually see significant increases in it, and that's what you can detect in your pregnancy test. All right, so as HCG starts to wane, all right, as we move through, all right, our first to our second trimester, then we can start to see a significant increase, all right, in estrogen and progesterone, right? And again, a lot of that has to do with our, uh, the placenta now kind of taking over, all right, and as the corpus luteum then degenerates into the corpus albicans, all right, the placenta is taking over, so we'll see an increased amount of progesterone and estrogen levels. All right, during the second and third trimester there. All right. So let's continue on into our second week here. All right. So now, all right, our blastocyst, all right, we get to day eight. Now we're calling it our embryoblast. All right. So here, let me go back to this little fella here. So now we're moving on our wheel, all right, from the cleavage stage, all right, now we're gonna be moving into our gastrulation, okay? We're gonna talk about what happens here, all right? 
the gastrulation, all right, so we've entered, we've left all right, our pre-embryonic period, and now we're going to be moving into our embryonic period here. All right, so by day eight, all right, our embryoblast, all right, has now formed two layers, very important, two layers, all right. So the two layers, the hypoblast layer and the epiblast layer. The hypoblast layer is going to be the layer that we find that's adjacent to the blastocyst cavity, okay? And that's going to be like, I don't want to call it the top layer, but if we're looking here at this picture, here's what we're going to be seeing. All right, our hypoblast layer is going to be, all right, the layer that's going to be closest to the to this, the blastocyst cavity. We're going to be developing another cavity down here. We'll talk about it. That's where our epiblast is going to be, all right, the epiblast layer, okay? Uh, I'll talk about that in a second. But point being is we now have turned, all right, our structure, our organism into just a flat disc, and we call that the bilaminar germinal disc. So at one point, you're like a Frisbee. Okay? As you're developing, you're a Frisbee, right? You're flat. Okay, so now what will happen is we're going to get a two-layer structure that will eventually then turn into a three-layer structure. Then after that, we're going to start to fold you, all right, and mold you into a somewhat humanoid-looking structure, which we're going to talk about here in a moment. Okay, all right, so our embryo blast, all right, if you re recall, the embryo blast is this glob of cells here, all right, so our embryo blast is now going to start to differentiate into two layers, okay, so that this outer layer here, okay, that's the hypoblast, and the lower layer here, all right, that's going to be the epiblast, all right. So we talked about what goes on with those layers, all right? What about the what we call the extra embryonic membranes? Okay? The extra embryonic membranes. Okay? So these extra embryonic membranes, all right, are going to facilitate a lot of functions for our developing embryo. One, it's going to protect the embryo, but two, it's going to help in the obtaining of nutrition. Right, and then obviously during metabolism of these cells, as they're growing, as they're uh, differentiating, all right, as they're growing, all increasing in number, all right, we need to um, monitor the metabolism. So it's going to uh, help facilitate gas exchange, and then finally we're going to have wastes from all these processes. All right, these structures are going to help get rid of those wastes. Okay, so these embryonic uh, membranes come both from the trophoblast, that's that outer layer, that ring layer, and also from the bilaminar germinal disc, okay? So one of these extra embryonic membranes is known as the yolk sac. So kind of like, you know, an egg, right, that we've seen in, in, in poultry and whatnot, we too have a yolk sac, okay? So this is the actual first embryonic membrane to develop. And so it's going to be hanging off of that hypoblast layer there, all right? So it's not the same, okay? It is not the same as what you see, all right, in our uh, in birds and reptiles, all right? It doesn't store yolk and the yolk being uh, what sustains the embryo, okay? But what we'll see here is, all right, we're going to see it. It's crucial for blood cell and blood vessel formation. Okay, so it's not food or nutrients that we're going to be feeding off of, like you see, all right, in chickens and whatnot, and snakes and lizards, all right, but we will use the yolk sac, all right, to help with our blood vessel and our blood cell formation. That's crucial. All right, the other extra embryonic membrane is going to be known as the amnion. Now, the amnion, all right, eventually all right, is going to surround the entire embryo, all right? You've heard of the amniotic cavity and the amniotic fluid, all right? So eventually, over time, this amnion is going to 
cover our embryo, and then it will fill up with amniotic fluid, all right? But it creates this cavity, which we refer to as the amniotic uh, cavity, okay? Now, this layer is going to be continuous with the epiblast layer, all right? <laughs> it's literally true, all right? This layer, or not this layer, but this structure prevents, all right, our membrane from drying out, okay? And it does so by producing this amniotic fluid, which in time will cover the, the, the entirety of the embryo. All right, and then finally, our last extra embryonic membrane is going to be the chorion. And if you remember, I told you it was made up of the cytotrophoblasts and the syncytiotrophoblasts, all right? But this will eventually become the placenta. But it's the chorion, both of these cell layers, that are going to, during that implantation phase, all right, the cells here are going to blend in and fuse with the functional layer of the endometrium, which is going to burrow in there. All right. And this is where we're going to start to see, all right, the exchange of materials, all right, from mother and the embryo. And, that, and the chorion is going to facilitate that. So as we continue on looking here at our pictures, okay, you can see our blastocyst is coming along into the uterine cavity here, and eventually it implants. Okay, so you got your trophoblast layer on the outside, all right, and then you have your embryo uh, layer on the inside pushed off to one side. All right, so all right, our blastocyst implants. Now we get the extension here. All right, from the trophoblast, our cytotrophoblast and our syncytiotrophoblast. And you can see how it's just invading as the embryo starts to burrow its way here into the functional layer of the uterine lining. And that as that's occurring, now we're starting to see the formation of this new cavity here. That's the amniotic cavity. Okay, but you can see here our embryoblast has now converted into two cell layers. All right, two cell layers. This outer layer here, this thinner layer, that's the hypoblast. And then this one right here, this thicker layer, that's the epiblast. And that's our bilaminar germ disc. So you can see the yolk sac formation occurring here by the hypoblast. And then our amniotic cavity, all right, is forming, all right, close to the epiblast. Right. And it's this, uh, um, um, structure starts to invade further into the functional lining, you can start to see, all right, these uterine glands, one, becoming more numerous, growing, becoming larger, all right, these structures here, the chorion, is eventually going to uh, give us the placenta, but it's also going to help provide us with a lot of uh, 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 functional blood, all right, for um, the formation of nutrient exchange, waste disposal, all right? So we'll talk about that here soon, but let's talk about first, okay? We'll start with the outer layer here, okay, the chorion, and how it's going to give us the placenta. All right, so as you know, all right, hopefully as you know, the placenta is going to be the structure that's going to help sustain, all right, the embryo and the fetus here, okay? It's, it's, it's crucial to the development, all right, of the embryo. All right, so as such, the placenta is a highly vascularized structure, okay? This is where we're going to see the exchange of blood between mom and the fetus, okay? So what we'll also see, obviously, you know, all right, the function of blood is to provide nutrients and take away uh, waste products from metabolism. All right, we'll also see the exchange of respiratory gases, carbon dioxide and oxygen. All right, it is also the structure that infers upon all right, the fetus embryo all right, that passive immunity, the acquired immunity, all right, where mom is going to be given all right, the embryo and fetus, her antibodies, all right? Again, that won't last, all right, very long after birth, all right? But this helps the fetus, all right, in the likelihood of some sort of 
uh, opportunistic infection that may occur with mom, all right, this, this exchange here all right, will help, hopefully, the fetus to be able to combat any type of opportunistic infection within limits, okay? In the second trimester, all right, the placenta is the structure that is going to be producing the estrogen and progesterone, and its job, those hormones, is to sustain, maintain that uterine lining there, okay? So we will start to see the formation of this structure in our second week, day eight, right? All right, so what are some of the parts to the, to the placenta here, okay? So again, like I was saying, all right, the chorion is going to eventually become uh, the placenta here, all right? So when we talk about the placenta, you're going to have the maternal portion, all right? And then you're going to have the, um, uh, what's the, uh, the embryo portion, okay? So there's going to be a connection between both of those, and we refer to that as the connecting stalk, which will eventually become the umbilical cord. All right, but inside the connecting stalk is where we're going to find our umbilical arteries and veins, okay, which will then facilitate the movement and exchange, not the exchange, but the, the movement of fetal uh, internal blood flow there, okay? All right, so you'll notice, and I'll show you a picture here, uh, as the, as the uh, placenta is developing, it starts to kind of grow these like projections, all right? We call them chorionic villi, all right? And they kind of come off of the chorion, but they start to uh, invade into the uterine lining here. And eventually, all right, these chorionic villi will become these branches of the umbilical vessels that we just talked about, okay? So we're going to start to, as, as the structure starts to develop and mature and whatnot, all right, it starts off with these real basic, uh, branches the and these uh, umbilical vessels will then differentiate into uh, arteries and veins here. But keep in mind, all right, this these chorionic villi, all right, and this the whole placenta in itself is going to help to ex, uh, facilitate the exchange of nutrients and wastes and respiratory gases between the mother and the fetus here. All right, we will not see all right a mixing of blood. Keep that in mind. There is no mixing of blood here, okay? So even though, all right, the blood streams for both the uh, fetus and, uh, and, and the mom are close by, they do not mix. It's always going to be a diffusion, all right? We will see a constant diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide, all right, between maternal blood flow and fetal blood flow, all right? So it will be diffusion, not mixing. It's important that you understand that, okay? All right, a couple of things about the, uh, the uh, development of the placenta. Most of its growth occurs during the fetal period, all right? It is going to be firmly attached onto the wall of the uterus, all right? It plays a big role, all right, in sustaining the fetus, okay? After uh, childbirth, all right, the placenta will be um, it will be expelled. All right, afterwards. Okay, and it, once it is, we refer to it as afterbirth. So it's like a plasma membrane. It's selectively permeable. Okay, it's only going to let certain things pass by. Obviously, all right, really small structures like respiratory gases can move by uh, across the, uh, the placenta with ease, all right? But certain hormones and microorganisms, all right, uh, it'll be much more difficult for them, okay? Like a parasite, all right, would have a great difficulty in trying to cross over. Now, unfortunately, we can have harmful substances cross over that placental uh, lining there, all right? Obviously, if they're really small, all right? Certain viruses, bacteria, obviously drugs. We're very familiar with alcohol. You've all heard of, well, most of you may have heard of fetal alcohol syndrome, all right? So these things all right, can cross, and if they do cross, they can cause birth defects or even possible death, all right? And obviously, it depends on the amount, all right, and the timing, all right, 
of when where, where we're looking at during fetal development, all right, embryological development, when these substances cross uh, the placenta, all right, can determine what the outcome may be, either birth defect or, or possible death, all right. That's why, all right, doctors will tell um, uh, pregnant mo mothers to, all right, obviously, if you have any bad habits, try, well, don't try, you, you should stop them. You know, if you're a smoker, stop smoking. All right. If you like to drink, all right, uh, stop drinking. Now it, it's crazy because I've talked to certain, um, uh, OBGs and they have said, um, you know, it's okay to have like a half glass of wine. Okay. So that varies everything, obviously things in moderation, but at the same time, um, my personal take is just for nine months, try, just don't, don't drink any alcohol. You know, better be safe than sorry, all right? And then obviously, if you're taking drugs, don't do drugs. All right, so here you can see when we're talking about the extra embryonic membranes here, all right, as we have our blastocysts implanted on the wall here, you can start to see, all right, during, all right, the um, gastrulation phase, we start to get that hypoblast layer forming, the epiblast layer form, and we get the development of the yolk sac and the amniotic cavi cavity here at the amnion. All right, you can see our syncytiotropoblast and the trophoblast in invading here into the uh, endometrium. You can see the increased size and structure here, all right, of the chorion as it differentiates into, all right, the placenta here. Okay, and I'll show you another picture here. As it grows, even before, let me go back here before I forget. All right, here are those little amniotic, not amniotic villi, all right, but those little um, chorionic, chorionic, excuse me, villi extending into, all right, the endometrium here. And then as we move further through, all right, you can see as they really start to grow in size. And on the other side here, we can see more uterine gland development, and then you get these little sinusoids, which are just these little pockets of blood here, okay? So as we start to further, all right, you can see by week four, all right, how things are growing in size and differentiating. We're starting to see, all right, some folding here. We'll talk about that in a moment, all right? But we really can see a nice, huge, huge difference now. Now look, week four, all right, we're a month into this thing, all right? And in week four, you can see, all right, the formation of, all right, these villi here in which they've got, all right, small blood vessels already, all right, both oxygenated and deoxygenated blood vessels here, which are present that are going to help to facilitate. Down here at the bottom of our page, all right, this is by the placenta, all right, so this will be closer to the developing embryo of the fetus. And then over here at the top of the page, this is um, the mom's uh, uh, blood uh, uh, vascular system here. And you can see as that blood is spilling into the tissue here, all right, these chorionic villi here are going to allow for the diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide across the tissue and then into the embryonic and fetal uh, um, uh, blood system and then off into the placenta here. Right. So just this is just trying to kind of give you a take on how much this has occurred in four weeks. All right. Of what's happening here. We're starting to see all right, the folding. We'll talk about this here in a, in a moment during gastrulation here. All right. How we start to differentiate the tissue here. You can see all this is occurring in the first four weeks. All right. Let's talk about. Uh, gastrulation we will. I'm going to stop here for this uh, uh, slideshow for this part and uh, I'll pick up in the uh, second video here for you. Of course you know what to do if you have any questions how to get in contact with me. All right so I'm going to stop here and kind of let you just absorb all that information.